On this week's episode of My Money Cast, we talk about free video games in Heads Up. We discuss the basics of savings and investments for our big topic, and we're joined by real life financial planners from Quilter for some real talk. 4 p.m., we're live, and this is the Money My Cast by My Bank. So, welcome to the show for this week. Don't forget, if you're joining us, you can watch along every week at 4pm and any of these places down here at the bottom, all of our social media channels. If you are watching us, welcome, hello, to episode 5 of the My Money Cast by My Bank. This week, we are talking all things savings and investments. I am Nick Smith-Patel. I'm your Head of Education for Young Adults at My Bank and your host of these Money Casts every week. We're on week 5 and my mic turned on first time. We're getting there. Movement, definitely. Um, if you want to send us anything for any future shows, if you have any questions, feel free to drop it to us in an email at info at mybank.org. Alternatively, if you're watching live and you have questions you want to ask, put it in the chat and we can get to you in real time. But for the start of the show, let's get straight into Heads Up. So Heads Up, our roundup of the week's news you might have missed. Let's start with a nice one, pocket money. Uh, lots of children at home at the moment trying to work out how to keep busy. Well, this parent has found a great way to help her children learn the value of money uh, using a vending machine. This is a great idea. For a £100 investment, Sarah Ballston, who has four children, filled her uh, machine with junk snacks. And the children can only have the junk snacks if they earn their pocket money by doing chores like cleaning the dishwasher and uh, taking out the old milk bottles for the milkman. Um, this is how she's teaching her children how to deal with their cash. I think that's a great idea. One thing I will say, as part of the research for this, I tried to find another vending machine for 100 pounds good luck really really expensive but if you can get them cheap maybe that's a way to teach your young people or your children how to value money a little bit more next up uh mortgage repayments uh holidays we talked about uh the scheme that richie sunak had in place um for making sure that people who were working were supported with the furlough scheme uh, and there have been schemes in place to help people who have credit issues like mortgages credit cards that kind of stuff we are now he announced that the mortgage payment holiday will be extended for another three months uh so you can basically defer payments on your mortgage for three months it does mean you might have to pay more interest later down the line uh i have a quote for you here from uh uk finance saying a payment holiday might not be the right choice for everyone and borrowers should only apply if they need one we would encourage any borrowers concerned with their financial situation to check with their lenders the one thing to say is that just because it's on offer doesn't mean you should take it i've talked about this before when we talked about debt and borrowing and we talked about uh, whether you should take a credit card increase only you know you need to think about what's going to happen after the lockdown is ended however this extension means that if your landlord for example if you're renting your landlord might be able to get help all the way up to october um which will then take them through to january for three months of support and if you are a landlord and you own your own property and you are facing a bit of financial hardship make sure you look into that scheme help while you can finally uh, you know i like to talk about one free thing you can do every week we've talked about theater we've talked about uh daniel radcliffe doing harry potter we've talked about all sorts this week we're going to talk about video games we did board games last week epic games you might know them they're the makers of Fortnite. well they have got on the free game bandwagon after xbox and um, playstation did it early on they have been giving away a free game every week and unfortunately <laughs> it turns over at four o'clock on a thursday so if you're watching this you've already missed civilization however on reddit there's a couple of people floating this image around we think think maybe that the next one will be the borderlands handsome collection and then arc survival evolved the week after that so if you're looking for a free video game to keep you busy during the lockdown epic games uh, doesn't cost you a penny you don't have to pay a subscription like you do with playstation plus or the xbox schemes um so a way to have a bit of free entertainment so that's the heads up. Let's get into our big topic. Let's talk savings and investments. So in the past few weeks, we've talked a lot about how to make money, how to save money, how to get help if you need it. Let's talk about making that money work for you now. You've made this money, you've put it away somewhere safe. What are you going to do with it? Uh, first of all, the question we get asked a lot when I do face-to-face -face training with people is, uh, do I save it at home or do I save it in a bank? Uh, and Simple answer here is you should probably put it in a bank. Problem with putting it in your house. Number one, if you get robbed, not many insurance companies that are going to cover you for having cash in your home, especially if you've just shoved it in your mattress uh, or underneath the sofa in a cardboard box. Um, there was a story actually of, a, of an old lady who had a load of money saved up over many, many years, and she'd been stuffing it in her mattress to keep it safe. The problem is she didn't tell anyone. 
that that's where the money was. So when this lady unfortunately passed away and her family were clearing out the house, of course they threw out the old mattress. And it was only when they were at the skip, throwing the mattress onto the skip that they saw these notes coming out the side of it. Really important that if money's in a, a savings account or in a, an account that someone can find, that if something happens to you, your money's accessible. So while it might feel safer to keep it at home, banks are probably the better option. Now I know what you're saying, but the banks might fail, they might crash. It's very rare that a bank does fail, but if a bank does fail in the UK, that you are protected for up to 85,000 pounds of your deposits under something called the FSCS, the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. It's a mouthful, I know, but if you go to your bank, there'll normally be a purple poster that explains all of this, and you can ask your bank about this as well. The only thing to be careful about is that it does work for uh, umbrellas of banks. So if you have two accounts, with two banks that are actually owned by the same big company, you're only protected for one set of 85,000. So that is something to be to bear in mind. Um, but yeah, don't be like the mattress lady. Don't make, make sure your money is accessible uh, and you're not putting yourself at risk as well. Now, one of the great things about having your money in an account is you start to earn what we call compound interest. Now, a lot of people will have heard of this. I'm not gonna try and explain it. I'm gonna show you a video from Investopia, which I think does a better job of it. So this is what compound interest is. Compound interest is the interest an investor earns on his original investment, plus all the interest earned on the interest that has accumulated over time. It is easier to think of compound interest as interest on interest. To understand compound interest, let's first look at simple interest, the interest earned on the original principal only. Suppose you deposit $10,000 into a high interest savings account at a 5% simple interest rate for three years. The interest you earn each year is 5% times 10,000, which equals $500, for a total of $1,500 of interest at the end of year three. $500 plus 500 plus 500. Now instead, suppose that you deposit the same $10,000 at 5% interest compounded annually. In year one, the interest you earn is the same, $500. But in year two, the interest you earn is 5% times 10,500, the original amount plus the interest you earned in year one. So the second year's interest is $525. In year three, you earn 5% interest on $11,025. $10,000 plus 500 year one interest plus 525 year two interest for an interest payment of $551.25. In total, you earn $1,576.25 in interest over three years with compounding interest versus $1,500 with simple interest, a difference of $76.25. The effect of compounding becomes especially powerful over longer time periods as the amount of earned interest becomes larger and larger. Now that curve that you saw at the end of that is sometimes known as the millionaire's curve and it's one of the ways that people talk about getting rich. You use that compound interest to make your wealth by making sure you regularly save, leave it for a long period of time and the longer you leave it, the higher that curve gets to be. The other side of that, if you want to think about it in one way, is the earlier you start saving, the sooner you start that curve going, the, the sooner you'll have that peak starting to come up and the longer you leave it for, the more benefit it is to you. So that's what compound interest is. Uh, Something to bear in mind, if you're borrowing, interest compounds as well. So it's not always a good thing. If you're earning interest, it's great. If you're spending it, something to bear in mind. Now, how do I save? Now we're gonna get into investments and we're gonna park investments for a second, but savings is lots of different ways to save. In okay, so I'm gonna show you a couple of different ways uh, that you might have heard about and might not have heard. About. First of all, we've got your standard interest, uh, sorry, regular inter instant access savings account from your normal high street bank. Uh, if you've got a savings account, this is probably what it is. Then you've got ICES, individual savings accounts, and we'll talk about those in more detail. And then you've got things like bonds and premium bonds, which are an interesting one. But let's talk about these. Number one, your high street bank. Your, your normal high street bank is normally relatively easy to open. You tend not to need to have too much money up front. You know, some it's a pound to open your account. Um, and some of the new banks like Starling and Monzo and those kind of new funky banks, rather than having a savings account, they offer you the chance to have a pot that you can put money into, which never actually leaves the current account. So any interest that the current account is earning, you're still getting, but it just parks it aside for you, uh, almost like you're putting it in a little envelope for yourself at home. So 
it's up to you whether or not you want to have a savings account or a pot but there are differences uh the big thing you want to check for is the interest rate and we'll explain how to check that in just a second the next thing is an isa now isas tend to have better interest and a cash isa is a savings account where the interest you make isn't taxed so it's all yours if you earn any interest in a normal uh, savings account you have to pay your normal share to the tax man in this case you don't uh anyone over the age of 16 can have one of these you, you, there are, uh, you know twenty thousand pound a year maximum going into this account but you can have as much as you want normally depending on the bank's limit uh saved going forward for one tax year so that twenty thousand pounds starts from april 6th and ends on april 5th of the next year and then you get another twenty thousand or whatever the new limit is for that new tax year but then there is another type of isa called a lifetime isa special type of isa you can put four thousand pounds into this one which counts towards your twenty thousand but this gives you a, a different benefit so for this one you can use the money that's made to buy a house and if you put four thousand pounds in the government will top it up with an extra thousand problem is if you choose to take that money out earlier than 60 years old or for a reason that is not buying a house then you lose the bonus that you're getting so slight problem there in terms of if you want to take the money out quickly now the other option is a bond or a premium bond saving bonds uh essentially it's like you borrowing the bank some money and then paying you some interest like reverse uh of what you might be used to but then premium bonds are something different on the screen you can see the picture there from M nsni this is a premium bond payment made to someone who has won on their premium bond so the way it works it's backed by hmrc so it's perfectly legit all on the up and up uh, and they replace the idea of interest with cash prizes and payments so the minimum payment is £25 if you win, right up to potentially a million. Um, but you have to invest the minimum of £25 as well. Each £1 you invest, you get a bond number. So that's an entry, essentially, to the draw. And you can have up to £50,000 worth of bonds in that draw. Anything above that, you don't get the, uh, the actual entry anymore. So it might be an idea if you've got more than £50,000 to invest that maybe not all of it is going in there because after 50, you're losing the, the benefits. Uh, however, you can withdraw this whenever you like so there are a few different ways that you can save most of us will be in a high street bank account but there are other options and we're going to talk to some people later on about what if you want to invest instead now just quickly looking at the chat beetroot can i have more than one more than one isa mm, i don't believe you can uh the twenty thousand pound limit as well is per person so um but so in the year you can have more than one isa yeah but the twenty thousand pounds is still fixed so you couldn't have two ices with forty thousand pounds. You could only have twenty thousand pounds going in. Um, but you can have the ISA and the lifetime ISA. The lifetime ISA four thousand does count against your ISA limit of twenty thousand pounds. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, do let me know if there's any more questions. Uh, Beetroot says I never win. I'm guessing that's about the premium bonds. I haven't yet either. I've got about fifty pounds worth. I haven't had it yet. But you never know. It might change. Um, got to win it is what they say, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, let's move on to AER. You may have seen this when you look at bank accounts and think, well, what do you mean AER? Very, very simply, AER stands for the annual equivalent rate. How much interest you're going to earn if you save money with them. So it's the good number. We talked about APR when we talked about borrowing and we said we want to keep our APR as low as possible because that's what we're paying out. In this case, we want our AER to be as high as possible. You can actually use websites like Compare the Market to look at different savings accounts and look at different rates that they're gonna offer. So you can see here, some of these ICEs are offering 1.2, uh, 1.1, and we scroll right the way down and we started to look, we're trying to look for Barclays or a kind of name bank. And when we stopped at a normal bank account, we got down to 0.5, for example, Barclays. So there's different interest rates. And obviously the higher the number here, the better for you in this case, because this is AER, it's money you're earning. A-E-R, E is earn, A-P-R, P is pay. Always remember that. E, earn, P, pay. Now, what do you mean by an investment? Like, what, what, what's the actual term mean? Well, the, the dictionary definition of it is the action or process of investing money for profit. So you're going to put money in to get more money out as long as everything goes the right way. Um, the one thing about an investment is that it's not always guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. Uh, and you are taking a level of risk. And we'll talk about risk in just a sec. In terms of how to invest, here's some basic ideas, uh, basic ways that people invest their money. So, investments. First of all, you probably, if I say investments, the first thing that comes to most people's minds, stocks and shares. Uh, stocks and shares is when you basically buy a 
a portion of a company. A company will cut itself up into little pieces of shares and you can buy some. Uh, and then if that share gets worth more money and you sell, then the difference between what you bought, bought, that paid for it and what you sold it for is your profit. And people do that back and forth making money. So that, if I say investments, most people I'm guessing would imagine this as the kind of first port of call. If you're not thinking about that, you're probably thinking about commodities. You can sell gold and oil and things like wheat and uh, I believe orange juice in America is a big commodity. I might be wrong. We'll talk to our investment guys later on about this. But all these kind of things. And the idea is that if something's going to become rarer, the price is probably going to go up. So I know that what, there's a couple of films that I've seen and a couple of uh, TV shows where in America, they watch really carefully how good the crops are going to be for a certain uh, plant because that will determine whether the price will be up or down and they know whether to buy or sell that commodity. So you can trade in all of these things. The other thing you can trade in is currency. So you've probably heard uh, Bitcoin and digital currency, but people have been selling pounds and euros and yen for years and just waiting for the currency markets to change. When Brexit happened, the pound went and went straight down. And a lot of people capitalized on that and bought pounds when it was cheap. And then as the price creeps up, as it's worth more and we sell for profit, that's where the investment there is made. So you can invest in currency as well. Cryptocurrency is a whole different thing. And if you are really interested in cryptocurrency, put it in the chat, send us an email. We might do a separate show on it because it's a whole different ball game. Then you've got things like gilts and corporate bonds. Now, these are fixed interest securities and uh, a way for a company or a government to raise money from you guys. Um, essentially you become investors in that company and it's a kind of security. Now in the UK, the UK government can uh, issue them, they're called gilts. I think this is an early version of a gilt, you can see the screen. Um, and the idea is that the interest rate is better than normally better than maybe a savings account. So you might want to put it into a gilt rather than to your bank savings account. But the other way that people can invest and one that's overlooked a lot is assets. Buying stuff that would make more money later that and, and this one you know people think about houses you buy a house and you can sell it for more money wonderful but there's a lot of assets people don't consider that might be worth some money if you know a comic book collector they might argue that they're making an investment in these comic books that they're going to be worth more money later uh, i know that my mum invested in mcdonald's toys i have a whole box of them mum sell them ebay i'm sure we can make some money on them now do it coronavirus time sell it but the idea of having an asset that's worth more money later, if, you, if you're buying it for that reason, you're investing. You, you know, stamp collectors do it all the time. So it doesn't just have to be big assets. It's anything that might generate a profit later on. And essentially, that's the basics of, of investments, I guess. And, and in terms of the basics of what you might hear about on the news, in terms of when people invest, this is what they're doing. But we're going to get the experts in in just a bit. So don't worry. Don't panic. Now, the other thing when you're investing is that there is always... Um, a risk potentially if you invest your money. There's no sure thing. Uh, there are things that are very low risk that might always pay out nine times out of 10, but there's always that one time out of 10 that you might not get paid. Now, when people think about investments, they think about something called a risk to reward ratio. Um, again, I'll let a video explain the this one. The risk to reward ratio tells you how much you stand to profit for every unit of currency you risk. A risk to reward ratio of 1 to X tells us that for every dollar you risk, you stand to generate a profit of X dollars. For example, let's say you buy one share of company A at $100 and promise yourself you'll never sell until the price reaches exactly $400, even if it means writing the stock down to zero and losing your money. In this case, one, you are risking $100, and two, if the share price does reach $400 and you sell, you are left with $300 after subtracting the $100 you've paid for it. In other words, you are risking $100 for a potential profit of $300, or a risk-to-reward ratio of 1 to 3. As another example, Bill's friend Rachel makes him an offer that they both put down $1,000, flip a coin, and whoever wins receives the resulting $2,000. Bill quickly realizes that he would risk $1,000 for a $1,000 potential profit and refuses, explaining that a risk-to-reward ratio of 1 to 1 for a 50% probability coin toss is not attractive since he is not at a probabilistic advantage. A month later, Bill's other friend, Tom, feels lucky and says he would be willing to risk $5,000 on the coin toss with Bill only risking 1000 bucks. In this case, even if he knows there are never guarantees, Bill accepts because he likes the idea of risking $1,000 for a potential profit of $5,000 on a 50% probability event. Pretty logical, right?
makes sense on the face of it. So the idea being that if you're going to put more risk in, you might get re more reward. And actually with pensions, if you have a workplace pension, you might have been asked about how much risk do you want to take? My workplace pension, I got told that my stocks, my, all my uh, money that I put into my pension is currently in a balanced plan. It's quite level. Um, it might be a bit more high risk than normal. And as I get older, the risk will go down because they don't want to risk my money closer to the time when I might need it. So you might have been asked, do you want to take a high risk or a low risk approach? And that's kind of some of the same thinking that's going on in the background there. So that's the basics, but we want a bit more, right? Surely we need to know some more about investing. Not enough. Well, for that, I have some very special guests with me and we're going to get straight into it with Real Talk. So for this week's Real Talk, I'm really happy about this. We've got some actual experts in to help us out here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, David, David Henry, who is the investment manager for Quilter uh, Cheviot. Have I said that right? Yeah, I've done. Yeah, oh, yeah I have but... said it right. <laughs> Good. OK, I'm so glad I've been practicing that all day. Uh, also with me today, I have Gabriella Strug. Have I said that right? Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Uh, and she is a financial planner for Quilter PCA. Guys, thank you very much for joining us today. Pleasure. Awesome. So um, I have some questions that I uh, like to just kind of go through. And I guess if, if either of you wants to take it, just feel free to shout and we'll kind of go to the right person. Um, but I guess before we go any further, do you want someone to explain kind of who Quilter are, what do they do and what your jobs specifically entail? Well, um, happy to, yeah, happy to take this one and explain what I do. Um, so I work for Quilter Private Client Advisors. I work really closely um, with my clients to um, help them save or work towards their, all their financial goals, whatever that may be. Um, so that could be um, saving for a house, saving for retirement, um, anything they're planning towards financially, I look to try and make sure that they're in the best um, tax shelter possible to make that happen. Awesome, that's great. And uh, what about for you, David? Well, once a client or a customer of ours has decided following a conversation with Gabriella that they do want to invest some money, uh, that's where I come in. So my day job is investing in a whole collection of different types of assets, pretty much everything that you just described there, Nick, although sadly we haven't yet invested in comic books or McDonald's toys, <laughs> haven't made their way into the portfolios. Um, but uh, it's my job to combine all those different kinds of investments to build what's called a portfolio or a collection of investments yep. for the client that's fit for purpose. Awesome. Um, so I think a lot of people out there will be kind of sitting there watching this and maybe they've had some ideas about maybe this is for them. Um, but normally when we hear investing, I think a lot of people tend to think of big money investing. So you know, how much money do I need to start being an investor realistically? So I think um, one of the fantastic things about the last 20 years, 30 years, certainly investment is the whole thing has become a lot more accessible. Um, you know, going back to the 1980s, 1990s, it was not only quite difficult to find somewhere to buy stocks and shares, but it was also very expensive. Yeah. Um, there are a number of digital apps and websites out there that allow you to invest what, have, what would have been thought of as relatively meager sums, um, you know, around that time frame. I know that there are a number of apps that allow you to even round up the amount of money that you're paying for a cup of coffee and invest that if you wish yes so you know it's much much more accessible than it used to be um and you know one thing i'm always keen to talk to younger people about when we're talking about investment is you know do not be intimidated try and get your head around the simple concepts because the rewards are, are there for the long term and i guess long term brings us nicely on, on to gabriella in terms of planning for where we're going to end up um, I think a lot of people during the lockdown have been taking stock of financial situations and you know where they're at and what they'd like to be at after this this all ends. So I think a lot of people are probably going to be thinking about saving and investing maybe more than they have pr prior to lockdown. So how do I know what's correct for me? Is there is there a you know a, a definitive answer? Is there a place to go? A process like how do I know what I should be doing essentially? So I guess in short, there's no um, one size fits all. Everyone has different objectives, um, which is why I love my job so much. It's um, it's so very day to day. But I guess a rough rule of thumb, what you've already touched upon would be ISAs. They are fantastic in terms of the tax shelter. Um, that there, there isn't a minimum that you have to put, out, put in. Obviously, there is the £20,000 maximum. Um, 
and also pensions. So absolutely, your first go-to ports of calls would be ISAs and pensions. Make sure you're, you're using those allowances for tax efficient purposes. Obviously, they serve different needs, um, but those would be the go-tos. But starting saving, saving is absolutely key. Um, the earlier, the better, all thanks to compound interest. Well, that millionaire's curve, we want to get that curve going as yeah. soon as possible. Um, so is there anywhere that you would recommend people go if they just want to look some information up or just understand a bit more about how this, apart from us, obviously us, come, come and see us, <laughs> but if, there, if there's any kind of trusted sources of information that you guys would, would put out there? I think, um, you know, Investopedia that you, um, you highlighted there, Nick, during the programme, I find really useful at the beginning of my career to get my head around the, the basics and the topics. Yeah. Um, is a really good place to start. Um, it would be remiss of me. I'd probably get a slap on the wrist not to point out that our website, www.quiltachieviate.com, has a lot of material on investing. It's not all the complicated market type stuff. There are lots more basic things in there if you're getting started. But for everyone along the range, hopefully there's, there's something of interest there for everyone. And I guess anything, uh, Gab Gabriella, about pensions or future planning like where would you send someone if they were just starting that journey? yeah I think obviously everyone always reaches towards Google um, and um, I to keep things simple Martin Lewis um, just summarizes everything love, uh, very nicely so um, I always say go to that it's it's worded really friendly um, in the way it's kind of it's a, put together but also as um obviously Dave has mentioned and there are a lot of specialist websites out there that you know don't be put off by going to those websites they may seem like they're these huge machines but the actual wording is really user friendly to understand um, so quilter for example has some fantastic literature around kind of ISAs and pensions the allowances and things like that so um certainly just have a google and spend some time one evening now that we're all stuck in lockdown um and yeah decrypt everything so um it's definitely worth looking into absolutely uh, i have a question here coming in from instagram live i have a live question um <laughs> does having higher ethics equal lower profits i think nope. that's one for you dave <laughs> um not necessarily. If you look at the historical data, um, companies that have historically behaved sustainably actually get, have done historically, gotten better long-term returns. And I think that there's, a, you know, there's an element of common sense to that. If you have a management team that believes in doing the right thing, not just by their shareholders, but by their customers and by their other stakeholders and, and dare I say, even wider society, then that is a company that is set up for long-term success. And if you're a shareholder in that business, you would then benefit from that success. So I don't think if you're, you know, you're investing based on, in line with your values or ethics that you should expect to generate lower returns. Absolutely not. And I guess, like, especially now, if you're even more conscious about the ethics, of, there is a danger that if a company isn't moving in that ethical way, that the optics of that mean that it's harder for them to generate profit because you don't want anything to do with them. Sure. Um, so I, absolutely. I think it's I think it's a really interesting time um, at the moment. Um, it's definitely something I'm coming across more commonly in conversations with um, my clients. Everyone really wants to know that they're investing ethically and in, you know, in responsible businesses that are um, kind of sending out the right message, doing the right thing and looking after their employees. So I think um, specifically around obviously coronavirus now, it'd be really interesting to see um, the shift that obviously a lot of companies that are offering kind of help towards NHS and charities and making donations in that way. So it'll be interesting to see that shift um, long term. Absolutely. Um, hopefully Instagram viewer that answers your question, but put it in the chat if you need more and we'll, we'll get you another answer. Thank you very much. Um, the last thing I have to ask is um, because investments all sound great, you know, higher interest rates, make money, set myself up for future. Um, what are the risks and what are the signs of a bad investment? The danger signs, if you will. Um, I think the, the main risk to be aware of is, is what's called volatility. Okay. And if you think about cash sat in the bank or underneath your mattress, and I know you recommended that you don't do that earlier, but if you think about a cash holding like that, the one thing that you're not seeing is the value moving around. Yeah. If you buy a share in a company or if you invest in any of those other kinds of investments that you mentioned, Nick, what you will see day to day are fluctuations in the value of those investments. And, Absolutely. you know, not that any of us get an estate agent round to value our house every day, but you would see exactly the same thing if 
you know, you add your house value to every day. So that's the, the first thing to be aware of. You know, if you invest in a company that does particularly badly, you know, airlines at the minute are really struggling yeah. because very few of us are flying. Mm-hmm. Um, if, the, if that company effectively goes bust, then you as a shareholder should expect to see the value of your share go to zero. Yep. So that's something to be really aware of. Um, there are, sorry, go no, on. Yeah, no, I was going to say that like, what happens in the news plays out in the markets. Is, is, you know, and I've heard that before. So you know, when things happen, it's going to have a knock-on effect. And if that company you've invested in is having a, an effect from what's going on in the world, then expect your money to change. I guess that's the line, isn't it? It's, you know, things happen and that will affect it. Absolutely. There are, there are a couple of ways, though, to protect against that risk. Mm-hmm. Um, the two ways, one of which you've mentioned already, is having a long-term view. And if you're prepared to take a long-term view with your investments, history would suggest that the longer term that you have or you leave the money for, the better chance of a positive, good return. Yeah. You know, typically, you know, savings, I would suggest, is any goal that's closer than three years away. If it's a goal that's maybe three years plus away, and the classic one would be for for you know, younger people would be retirement that seems a very, very long way away, then you can afford to take more risk yeah. because you've got more time for that investment to mature. The, the second way to defend against risk is diversification. And um, you know, put simply, that's not having all of your eggs in one basket. If you had invested solely in Netflix at the beginning of the year, None of us are going out. Our Netflix consumption has gone through the roof. You might be feeling very pleased with yourself. But similarly, you know, if you just bought something like an airline stock, you know, you're really, really struggling at the minute. So you need to have lots of eggs and lots of baskets. I wish I had stock in Zoom. I really wish I had stock in Zoom. <laughs> I, I was cleaned up. Um, I have a, a couple of questions from, from the social media, if you don't mind answering them. And please let us know if, if any of these are kind of dependent on the case. Um, But a question from Spencer is, if I utilize a financial planner, do they take a percentage of my profit gained? And a follow up off the back of that is, does that cut depend on the type of investment you're making? Um, So I can speak very kind of broadly around this. Um, So the way um, financial planners tend to work um, is they would charge a one off initial fee for kind of anything that we look to do from the beginning. And then we don't just like to set something up and leave you in it. We want to make sure that it's right for you year on year on year long term. So it's key that you review it. Um, Kind of touching upon what David said in regards to making sure diversification and risk is correct and volatility. And for that, um, for looking after it, it tends to be about 0.88% that we charge. So yes, that money isn't, we don't ask, you know, that money is taken from within the fund. So whether that's an ISA or a pension, you don't see a check turn up at your door and, you know, you have to pay it. It's taken from within the, effectively, the growth. I think 0.88%. Yes. Less than 1%. That, that's okay. <laughs> to put it into context, right? My wife is an actress. She has someone whose job it is to phone up people and get her jobs. They charge her 20% on some of those jobs. And all they've done is made a couple of phone calls. So 0.88% for a bit of financial planning might not be as big as you might imagine it to be. So just to put it into context there, there are other industries that work slightly differently uh, and it might be more expensive. So actually, I don't think that's the unreasonable 0.88. Um, great, and Spencer says thanks for the answer. And, and I guess I think we're, we're running out of time, so I'll wrap it up there. But folks, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to have you on. David, investment manager, thank you very much. Uh, Gabby, thank you for joining us and giving us your view. It's been a real pleasure. And um, yeah, thanks very much. I'll leave you to it. Welcome. Thanks, Thanks, Nick. And we're going to get into our top tips to wrap up today's show. Let's do it. I I don't know how you beat that. You've got two actual financial planners in the building talking about the work, and I've got to give top tips. Right, here's what I reckon. Number one, saving in a bank is going to be safer, safer than saving at home. Even if you just account for the FSCS protection and the risk of getting burgled, probably better to put it in a savings account. Number two, if you are going to put it in a savings account, compare AER, get the highest rate possible. AER, E is earn. Make sure you get more money. Number three, if you're investing, be sure to think about risk versus reward. And remember, nothing's guaranteed. Someone tells you they've got a sure thing. Watch our last week's show on scams and just make sure you've you've boned up on that as well. Uh, But that is going to wrap us up for this week's show. 
as always thank you very much for Ooh. Lich, thank you very much for joining us. If you'd like to get involved, like I said, here are the social medias. You can watch us at any of these social medias live every week at four o'clock. Uh, if you need to get a hold of us or send us anything you want us to air and any questions, any topics you want us to cover, you can email us at info at mybank.org. And as always, I've been Nick Smith Patel, Head of Education for Young Adults. And if you want to get a hold of me, you can email me on the same email address. Next week, we are covering consumer rights. What are your rights with cash, refunds, uh, what happens if you've got a holiday booked and you're not sure about getting the money back? What if you were meant to be married this year and the venue's not giving you your cash back? We're going to be talking about the rules, how you should be able to get some help and all the rest of that next week. But until then, stay safe, take care. See you next time.